Hello everyone, welcome back to the channel. Today I'll be checking out Alexander the Great, his whole history, all parts of it. As you guys know, I don't have lights in my country, so I had to on my generator to shoot this video and it's going to take close to probably over two hours or so. So guys, help me out, hit the like button, that's all I need from you. Hit the like button to get this video out to more people and subscribe to the channel if you are new, I really appreciate it. Let's get right into it. Yeah. 334 BC, Alexander, King of Macedonia, began one of the greatest military campaigns in history against the superpower of the, the greatest, age, actually. the Persian Empire. Just 20 years old, his brilliant and fearless leadership won him battle after battle. And in an astonishing 10 year campaign that took him to the edge of the known world, he carved out one of the largest empires ever known. Few men have had such a massive and impact by the on known world, meaning that the likes of the US, South America were not discovered yet. That is why by the time Christopher Columbus landed in America, in the Americas, I think I know most people said that people were already living there, the Native Americans and all that, but they were not the known world. Unfortunately, I know there was probably history. There's some, there's some history there with the Native Americans. But as we know, most of our modern civilization is, is being, has been controlled and has, and has been written by Europeans. So no matter how, there are so many debates, so many conspiracies about so many things, about whether some of the things that have been said by the Europeans are true. By the end of the day, they were the ones that built the modern civilization. Truthfully, truthfully, Europeans built the modern civilization. No matter how you feel about them, the slavery and all that stuff, or and the conquest and all that. And I also feel that same, I also feel the same way about it. Though I don't blame them fully, I also blame Africans who sold their people for nickels. And they still do that today. So I don't fully blame the Europeans for it, but it doesn't change the fact that Europeans, the current world that we live in, they are the ones that are responsible for what we are enjoying now, modern civilization. If you disagree, let me know that in the comments. Course of history. To the Persians, he was Alexander the Accursed. But to the West, he was immortalized as Alexander the Great. Goosebumps, goosebumps. Ancient Greece. From around 500 BC, this rugged land was the scene of remarkable developments in art, philosophy, and warfare. Its two greatest city-states were Athens, a naval power where democracy, art, drama, and philosophy flourished. And Sparta, an austere militaristic society famed for its formidable army. In 480 BC, these two city-states had joined forces to fight an invasion by the mighty Persian Empire. At the narrow pass of Thermopylae, a small Greek force led by 300 Spartans held yeah. up the enormous Persian army for three days before they were finally encircled and killed. This is Sparta! Then, in the Straits of Salamis, the Greek fleet defeated the Persian navy. But silver, they couldn't prevent the Persians ships. burning the sacred temples of the Athenian Acropolis. The next year at Plataea, the Greeks won a decisive land battle against the Persians and forced them to abandon their invasion. Hmm. The next 50 years were the golden age of classical Greece. But rising tension between Athens and Sparta and their allies eventually led to war, dragging the Greek world into decades of destructive fighting. 
Wars between the Greek city-states continued for almost a century, wow. leaving them exhausted and vulnerable to a new rising power to the north. Macedonia. For centuries, sophisticated Greeks had viewed the mountainous kingdom of Macedonia as a backwater, Hicksville, barely Greek at all. Hmm. But under King Philip II, Macedonia emerged as a formidable military force. His most famous reform? The introduction of the Sarissa, an 18-foot pike, twice the length of a normal Greek spear, mm. and wielded by trained infantry, fighting in close formation, known as a phalanx. In 338 BC, at the Battle of Chironia, Philip's army crushed the joint forces of Thebes and Athens. Through alliance and conquest, Philip had already gained control over most of his neighbours. Now, following this victory, he united all Greece in an alliance known as the Hellenic League, or League of Corinth, with Philip as hegemon, or supreme commander. Only Sparta stood aside. Philip began to plan a great campaign, a pan-Hellenic or all-Greek war against the Persian Empire. Mm. Their old foe was now an ailing superpower, its great riches ripe for the taking. But when they say great riches, what does that really mean? Obviously, I don't think oil was all had been discovered at that time and most of the things that iran has currently that are rich in human beings didn't discover them at that time so guys if you have any idea tell me what the riches that the Persian empire may have had that was ripe for the taking foe was now an ailing superpower its great riches ripe for the taking but on the eve of launching his war philip was assassinated by his own bodyguard Chris. Victim of Macedonia's brutal court rivalries. He was succeeded by his twin. Are we sure that was only a setup? Maybe the patients paid. I don't know when things like that used to happen in, during those times. Maybe the patients paid um, one of his paid his guards to do that for them. Maybe. Who knows? 20 year old son, Alexander. Brilliant. Restless tutored by the great philosopher Aristotle, Aristotle and already an experienced military commander. Alexander inherited his father's grand plan to invade Persia. Every time I hear this man's name, this Aristotle, I remember my primary school days. You guys call it in the West, I think only America. I don't know what they call it in the UK, elementary. Yeah, so we used to sing this song. Who do you know? I know Aristotle. He was a great teacher who taught Alexander. Who do you know? I know Aristotle. He was a great teacher who taught Alexander. Hmm. Just remembering all those times when life was so innocent with no problems, no pressure, no nothing. I wish I could go back, seriously. Yeah. But first, he had to secure his own position as king. At home, he had potential rivals executed, then crushed rebellions in Illyria, Thessaly, and central Greece. He made a special example of Thebes, completely destroying the ancient city and selling its people into slavery. You see, slavery has always been existing, even the great Alexander the Great was doing it as well. Like I'm saying, human beings, if given the opportunity, they will pay as low as possible for labor. That is it. It still happens up to today where corporations don't want to pay workers what they're supposed to pay them. You, you know? And, and I'm not saying that people should be overpaid. If that happens, inflation will go through the roof. But corporations can be a bit can do a bit better they can but no they want to be billionaires and whatnot so in the spring of 334 bc now ready to launch his war against the persian empire 
Alexander led his army across the Hellespont into Asia Minor. It was the start of one of the greatest military campaigns in history. Alexander's army was about 40,000 strong, drawn from all parts of Greece. The infantry were commanded by the veteran Macedonian general Parmenia. In the front rank, 9,000 Macedonian phalangites, armed with the 18-foot Sarissa. These were professional soldiers, well-trained and drilled, who formed up for battle in the phalanx, 16 ranks deep. This packed formation presented a solid wall of iron spear tips, and was virtually unstoppable. But it was also difficult to manoeuvre, and highly vulnerable to attacks on its flanks or rear. So 3,000 elite infantry, the Hypaspists, or shield bearers, armed with shorter spears, guarded its flanks. They were commanded by Parmenion's son, Nicanor. The second line of Alexander's army was made up of 7,000 Greek allies and 5,000 mercenaries, armed as hoplites. They took their name from the hoplon, their large round shield, and carried shorter eight-foot spears. A hoplite phalanx was not as effective as the Macedonian phalangites, but still well armed and heavily armoured for the time. The Agrianes were the army's elite skirmishers, expert javelin throwers from what's now southern Bulgaria. Other skirmishers from Thrace and Illyria were armed with javelins, slings and bows. The shock troops of Alexander's army were the companion cavalry. 1,800 elite horsemen, hmm. armed with spear and sword, commanded by Philotas, another son of Parmenion. Alexander led the royal squadron in person. There were also 1,800 cavalry from Thessaly, commanded by Callas. 600 from other parts of Greece, led by Eregius. And 900 mounted scouts from Thrace and Paeonia, under Cassander. The great Persian Empire was divided into provinces, called satrapies. Each satrapy was ruled by a governor, or satrap. Hmm. Those in Asia Minor, now threatened by Alexander's invasion, met to discuss strategy. Memnon of Rhodes, a skilled Greek general in Persian service, urged them to avoid battle with Alexander. Instead, he advised them to use a scorched earth strategy, to burn villages and crops and withdraw to the interior. Alexander's really? army, he promised, would quickly starve. I mean, that is a smart move. It was good advice, that is a smart move. but the satraps were unwilling to lay waste to their own provinces without a fight. They didn't want to make the sacrifice, and I and I get it, but to be honest, that was a very good strategy it was a very good strategy but i do understand the, the those that were there they want to do it i do understand that so they decided to face alexander's army at the river granicus suicide the persian army formed up behind the river which was shallow but 60 feet wide with steep banks their front line was a wall of cavalry, about 10,000 horsemen from across the empire. Medes and Hyrcanians from modern Iran, Bactrians from Afghanistan, and Paphlagonians from Turkey's Black Sea coast. Behind, in reserve, were the infantry, several thousand Greek mercenaries, a common sight in Persian armies at this time. 
These men fought for Persian gold and were armed with the round shield the and short gold. spear of hoplites. Okay. Okay. Gold was always good. Gold had been discovered at that time. So, okay. So there was gold. And they still gold in Iran, I think. They still go gold around that area that is that was special. So um okay. There was gold to be fought for. Now they fight for oil. What the US like doing. Anyway, there's this running joke or meme that if there is oil, the US will come to introduce freedom. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> The Persians may have been unsure if they could trust these men in combat against fellow Greeks, and so placed them at the rear. Alexander, determined to attack and destroy this Persian force before it could retreat, raced to the Granicus with his best troops. On his left wing he posted Thessalian, Greek and Thracian cavalry, under Parmenian's command. In the centre were the massed spears of the phalanx, its six divisions commanded by Perdiccas, Koinos, Amintas, Philip, Meliager and Crateros. On the right, Alexander himself with the companion cavalry under Philotas, wow. as well as the elite hypaspists, the Agrianis javelin throwers and the archers. Alexander, with 13,000 infantry and 5,000 cavalry in all, was probably slightly outnumbered. But ignoring advice to wait until dawn to cross the river, he ordered an immediate assault. He sent a squadron of companion cavalry to ford the river, followed by a regiment of hypaspists and the Paeonian light cavalry. Alexander, Man. calling on his men to Such show their balls. courage, then led his right wing across the river. Whoa! Nice graphics. As they reached the middle of the river, the Greeks came under a hail of javelins, darts and arrows from the Persian line. Those that made it to the far bank were immediately charged by the Persian cavalry. Alexander was in the thick of the fighting. Man. He attacked where the whole mass of their cavalry and leaders were stationed. Around him, a desperate conflict raged. Horses were jammed against horses, and men against men. The Macedonians striving to drive the Persians away from the riverbank. The Persians determined to prevent them crossing and to push them back into the river. Guys, I just have to say this. Congrats and kudos to the maker of this video, to the creator of this, to the creator of this video. This is crazy. Do you guys understand the amount of graphics that, graphics that it, it needs to be done to make this kind of video? This is crazy. Maybe I don't know what I'm talking about, but looking at this, this seems very, very hard. Very, very, I, I personally don't even have the software for design the first thing. Kudos to the creator of this video, seriously. Seriously, kudos to, to, the, kudos to the person. This is crazy. Alexander's attack seemed reckless, but he was buying time for the rest of his army to cross the river, including the irresistible Macedonian phalanx. Then, suddenly, Alexander was fighting for his life, charged by two Persian nobles. Roesasses rode up to Alexander and struck him on the head with his sword, oh. breaking off a piece of his helmet. But the helmet broke the force of the blow, and Alexander struck him down with his lance. Then, from behind, Spithridates raised his sword against the king, but Black Clytus, son of Dropidus, anticipated his blow, mm. struck his arm, and cut it off, Whoa. sword and all. Whoa. Now, I the... always wondered how they 
this kind of stories, how is if it's accurate? Because like, how can they remember everything? Like, because for this to be able to be said, that means someone that was in this battle. So what? What the person was fighting? How is the person able to see exactly what happened? Just as they are being, they are explaining it here, as the person was carrying up the sword, and the and the that that guy he caught him, caught his hand. I mean. Were you not fighting? Were you just standing there with a camera or something? Or or what like how? Now the Greek army was across the river, and the Persian cavalry faced a wall of Macedonian spears. Most turned and fled. Hmm. speed and shock of Alexander's attack meant Persia's Greek mercenaries hadn't even had time to join the battle. Alexander, in a blood rage, or possibly regarding these Greeks as traitors, ignored their appeals for mercy. The mercenaries were surrounded on all sides and massacred. Damn. Alexander had won a great victory. Asia Minor now lay at his mercy. But the Persian Empire was still a land of immense wealth and power. Already, it was mobilizing its vast resources to face him. If Alexander was to conquer this empire and take his place in history, he'd next have to face Darius, King of Kings himself. Man, the goosebumps, man. Now, as Alexander approached Sardis, capital of the Persian province of Lydia, its commander surrendered without a fight. But before Alexander could advance further, he needed to neutralize Persian naval power. Persia had a powerful fleet with major naval bases around the eastern Mediterranean that could potentially cut his lines of communication back to Greece. Rather than challenge the Persians at sea, Alexander decided to attack its nearest bases, the Greek coastal cities of Miletus and Halicarnassus. Both put up determined resistance, but were taken by winter. Following spring of 333 BC, Alexander continued his advance into Lycia and Phrygia. At Gordium, he was shown the legendary Gordian Knot, a prophecy said that whoever could unpick it would rule all Asia. <laughs> Alexander simply took his sword and sliced it in half. <laughs> this guy was a raging 20-something year old man. I mean, this is something that a young 20-something-year-old person would be doing. Someone that is a bit more mature would be like, okay, it is being said that you should do it this way. So you're supposed to try and do it this way. This guy is basically like almost a raging teenager, like, what the fuck? <laughs> Meanwhile, Memnon of Rhodes, a skilled Greek general in Persian service, led Persian warships into the Aegean and captured the islands of Chios and Lesbos. But after Memnon's sudden death from illness, the offensive was abandoned. Eighteen months had passed since Alexander's army crossed the Hellespont and invaded the Persian Empire. Now, Alexander led his men into Cilicia and was soon poised to cross the Noor Mountains into Syria. But then, the main Persian army, led by King Darius III himself, emerged behind the Greek army to the north. Mm. Darius was determined to trap and destroy Alexander's army, which he outnumbered almost two to one. So he blocked Alexander's only escape route by moving his army to the coastal plain near Issus, just six miles wide from mountains to sea.
the narrow battlefield would force Alexander to fight, but it also prevented Darius exploiting his huge numerical advantage. His army, by some estimates, was up to 100,000 strong, and contained some of the finest soldiers in his vast empire, including 10,000 of his own household troops, known as the Immortals. Oh, I think I, there is, I think there was a, is it a movie or a show that came out? Is it about, is, is that the, is that movie or show about it, the Immortals? I can remember something like that. I can remember something like that. You guys, tell me down in the comments if that is it. His best cavalry. I haven't watched the movie, by the way. I've not watched it, but I saw it online somewhere when it came out. So I'm just wondering whether it is that's what it's or that that particular movie or series was about this particular set of people. Were massed on his right towards the sea, where the ground was better for horses. His best infantry, his Greek mercenary hoplites, formed the centre. Persian infantry formed his left wing. Alexander deployed his own army for battle, once again entrusting his left wing, nearest the sea, to Parmenion, with the Greek cavalry and infantry. In the centre, as always, was the Macedonian phalanx. Alexander positioned himself and his best troops on the right wing, toward the mountain slopes. His elite Agriane javelin throwers, his archers, and behind them the Hypaspists and the companion cavalry. When Alexander saw the strength of the Persian cavalry facing Parmenion on the left, he moved across his Thessalian cavalry to reinforce him. Hmm. Despite his overwhelming numbers, Darius held his position behind a small river, the Pinarus, and waited for Alexander to attack. He didn't have to wait long. Alexander called out to his men, urging them to fight bravely, picking out some by name. Then, at the head of his army's right wing, he charged. Once again, the speed and shock of the Macedonian advance sent the enemy reeling back. But in the centre of the battlefield, the Macedonian phalanx was in trouble. In its effort to keep up with Alexander, its formation had become disordered. Mm. Now, in fierce fighting with Darius's Greek mercenaries, the phalanx was slowly being driven back. Alexander, seeing the danger, regrouped and led the companions in a headlong charge straight at the Persian center. Oh! The Greek mercenaries threatened on their flank were soon in disarray, and the Macedonian phalanx was able to resume its advance. Alexander fought his way towards the great king Darius himself. Rather than face this apparently mad and fearless Macedonian king, Darius fled the battlefield in his royal chariot. <laughs> uh... Meanwhile, the Macedonian left wing under Parmenion was in a desperate fight against the best of the Persian cavalry. If the Persians could break through here, they could envelop Alexander's army and snatch victory from the jaws of defeat. But Parmenion and his troops fought doggedly, and continued to hold the Persians at bay. As the news that Darius had fled spread among his troops, they abandoned the fight, and tried to save themselves. The battle turned into a massacre. Ptolemy, one of the Macedonian commanders, told Alexander there were so many Persian dead, 
His men had used them to fill a deep ravine so they could cross over it. Oh, what the hell? Whoa, 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 whoa. Whoa, no, 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 no. God, the dead bodies were so plenty that they were able to fill up a ravine. Damn. <sighs> Whoa. ...them to fill a deep ravine so they could cross over it. The Battle of Issus was a stunning victory for Alexander. And amongst the spoils of victory were Darius's wife, mother and three children, all taken alive oh. and well treated by Alexander. Hmm. With the Persian field army in retreat, Alexander now turned to subduing the western territories of the Persian Empire. The next year, 332, the coastal cities of Phoenicia submitted to Alexander, ending Persian naval power in the Mediterranean. But the island city of Tyre resisted. Tyre's defenders fought bravely and skillfully, even when Alexander began building a causeway to the island, protected by two giant siege towers, which they counter-attacked with fire ships. But after seven months, the city walls were breached and Tyre fell. Most of its citizens were killed or enslaved. Gaza, too, was taken by siege. Alexander continued to Pelusium on the Nile Delta, where the Persian governor of Egypt surrendered the entire province to Alexander, along with the royal treasury. Whoa. At Memphis, priests of this ancient land welcomed Alexander as their liberator from Persian rule, and crowned him pharaoh. <laughs> At the mouth of the Nile, he founded a new city, Alexandria. Okay. Then traveled Seriously, to the desert. So that, is where the name of, that is where the name of that city comes from. It's crazy, man. Oracle of Siwa, where according to some accounts, the priests welcomed him a son of Amun, king of the gods. Alexander returned east to Tyre, where in 331 BC he received news of trouble back home. Despite his great victories over the Persians, many Greeks regarded Alexander as a tyrant. King Aegis of Sparta, with Persian support, now launched a revolt against Macedonia. Antipater, Alexander's commander in Greece, was already dealing with rebellion in Thrace. Wow. But he quickly marched south and met Aegis in battle near the city of Megalopolis. Even the legendary Spartans were now no match for Macedonian military power. Spartan army was crushed. King Aegis himself was among the fallen. Hmm. You can never see things like that right now, where the king or the leader or the president dies in war. They just send people to go and die now. With his base in Greece secure once more, Alexander advanced towards the Persian heartlands, seeking a final showdown with Darius. He received a letter from the Persian king, offering him a fortune in gold, his daughter in marriage, and half his empire in exchange for peace. But Alexander's stunning victories, all the oracles and acclamations, had now convinced him that his destiny was to rule the world. He rejected the Persian king's offer. Mm. 
He didn't want half the empire. He wanted everything. He was coming to take it all. In 334 BC, Alexander, 21-year-old ruler of the small Greek kingdom of Macedonia, led an invasion of the vast Persian Empire. It seemed impossible odds. But thanks to Greek military dominance and Alexander's fearless leadership, he won two great battles against the Persians. At the river Granicus and at Issus. Having subdued Persian lands west of the Euphrates River, he now headed east into the empire's heartlands, seeking a final showdown with the Persian king, Darius III. Receiving news that a great Persian army led by Darius had assembled at Gaugamela, near modern Mosul in Iraq, he made straight for it. Wow, Iraq. This was Darius' last okay. chance to stop Alexander. The to Iraq was part of, anyway, I should have known that anyway. Iran, Iraq, Iran, Syria, all of them, around that place. And Alexander's chance to smash Persian power once and for all. The Battle of Guagamela. Darius had chosen to fight on open ground where his advantage in numbers would be more telling. His soldiers had also worked hard to clear and flatten the terrain, to make it suitable for Persian war chariots. By modern estimates, the Persian army was between 50 and 80,000 strong, Whoa. and made up of contingents from across the empire. Infantry from Syria and Babylonia, Cavalry from Armenia, India, and Central Asia. Up to 200 scythed chariots. Even a handful of war elephants. Alexander's army was smaller and may have been outnumbered by as much as two to one. Wow. He deployed his units in their usual formation. On the left flank, Thracian and Thessalian cavalry, commanded by Parmenion. In the centre, the Macedonian veterans of the phalanx, each armed with their 18-foot Sarissa pike. On the right flank, Alexander with his elite cavalry, the companions, and his best infantry, the Hypaspists. These were the units with which Alexander planned to launch his main attack. Greek hoplites formed a second line and supported both wings, which were angled back to guard against encirclement by the Persians. The battle began when Alexander led his wing out to the right, a move that took the Persians by surprise. Could Alexander really be trying to encircle their huge army? Not, no way, no way. The Persians mirrored his movement, taking troops away from their center to outflank Alexander and prevent him leaving the area they'd cleared for the Persian chariots. But Alexander's unusual maneuver was a trap to entice the Persians to weaken their center. When he saw that it had worked, he ordered his Greek okay. cavalry to charge, to keep the Persians fixed in position. A giant cavalry battle developed on the <laughs> right wing. That was smart. That was smart, Darius, man. meanwhile, judging this to be the decisive moment, unleashed his chariots. Expert Agrianes javelin throwers took out horses and crews. While the Greek infantry opened lanes, allowing the chariots to pass harmlessly through. Now 
Alexander led his companion cavalry and parts of the Macedonian phalanx in a headlong charge straight at the weakened Persian centre, fighting his way towards Darius himself. The sudden ferocity of Alexander's assault threw the Persians into panic. The centre of the army broke and ran, King Darius himself leading the rout. Alexander's left wing was in serious trouble. Parmenion, facing a huge onslaught by Persian cavalry, was virtually surrounded. Indian and Scythian horsemen had even ridden through a gap in the Greek line. But rather than wheeling and attacking the Greeks from behind, they'd carried straight on to loot their camp. sent a desperate appeal to Alexander for help. The king abandoned his pursuit of Darius, regrouped and charged the Persian right wing. Wow. Many leaders wouldn't, wouldn't do that, especially when they were almost pursuing the, the, the opponent's leader. You know, most of the time when you kill the opponent's leader, it's over. So, um, okay, not most of the time, but a lot of the time. And most leaders would not give that up to come back and help their other general. Seriously, most leaders would not do that. That This is really, really commendable. It was the hardest and bloodiest fighting of the battle, claiming the lives of 60 of Alexander's companions. Season, but... Finally, as news of Darius's flight spread across the battlefield, the last Persian horseman turned and fled. The Battle of Gargamela was a stunning and complete victory for Alexander. According to ancient sources, he lost just a few hundred men, while the Persians lost thousands. Alexander had the routed... Way they, the, the way they talk about human lives in war is very funny. They would just talk about it like, oh, he lost a few hundred men. I mean, who cares? The other people lost a thousand. That means you, you that lost hundred, you won. And the ones that lost a thousand or thousands, lost. I mean, like, those were human lives. People that were born and had dreams, or whether they didn't have dreams, I don't know. But the whole thing is just, every time I think about this war of a thing, usually when it comes to men, I know I, I'm not trying to sound sexist here, but it's men that mostly fight this kind of wars. I mean, even in the modern times, you can look at what's happening in Ukraine and Russia, it's men that are being forced to fight. You know, if they don't want to sign up for it, they are put in prison. So, um... I'm just saying, I don't know the day, man. It's all men, men's life has always been disposable. Even if a, if a war broke out in my country right now, my life would probably not mean anything anymore. So, it just I don't know. Men, men, men's life has, has always been disposable. We don't really matter that much. We only matter by numbers. Darius's great army, and now the road to Babylon the empire's main capital lay open. The Macedonian king entered the great city in triumph, recognized by Persian officials as its new rightful ruler. Really? So too at the city of the Susa, Opus. where Alexander ceremonially took his seat upon the royal throne of Persia. Damn. In the Zagros Mountains, at a pass known as the Persian Gates, a courageous Persian force held up Alexander's army for a month. Okay. The Greeks eventually found a mountain path that bypassed their position, allowing them to encircle and wipe out the defenders. In early 330 BC, Alexander reached Persepolis, the empire's ceremonial capital. Alexander wanted to appear as a liberator to the Persians as a legitimate successor to King Darius. But now he ordered Persepolis to be pillaged and burnt. 
retribution for the Persian invasion of Greece and the burning of Athens' sacred temples in 480 BC. Wow. Alexander now headed north into Media, where Darius had taken refuge in the royal city of Ecbatana. I mean, this Ekbatana. Darius is just running all over the place. Where is, why, Alexander why is he running? was determined to capture Darius, but the fugitive king fled east <laughs> in the hope of raising a new army in the provinces of Parthia, Bactria, and Sogdia. Man! It was not to be. As Alexander closed in, the Persian king was murdered by one of his own governors, Bessus, who then proclaimed himself the empire's new ruler. <laughs> That's Alexander a very bad gave move. orders for Darius to be buried in the royal tombs of Persepolis, alongside his ancestors. Wow, so respectful. Then he paused to organize his vast new empire. Alexander appointed viceroys to rule the provinces on his behalf, keeping several Persians who had sworn loyalty in their posts. Then he resumed his march east, his goal to find and kill the usurper Bessus, subjugate the empire's eastern provinces, and reach the far edge of the world. Yeah. Man, I have so much goosebumps, man. The soundtrack is crazy. The soundtrack is so crazy. I'm just, man, this guy had some balls. He had some balls. Man. Look at this. Wow. In 330 BC, Alexander continued his march east. His goal, to find and kill Bessus, a Persian usurper claiming to be the rightful king, and to subjugate the empire's eastern provinces. Alexander headed first for Arya, today part of Afghanistan where the Persian governor Sati Barzanes had launched a revolt after initially pretending to submit to Alexander. The rebellion was crushed and Sati Barzanes killed in single combat by a Greek cavalry officer. Man. Nearby, Alexander founded the nice city tough. of Alexandria nice Ariana, tough, modern Herat, one of around a dozen cities that Alexander would eventually found almost all bearing his name. Alexander marched on to Frada. The Macedonian court had a long tradition of plots and assassination. Six years before, Alexander's own father, King Philip, had been murdered by his bodyguard. He was now informed that Philotas, commander of his companion cavalry, had uncovered a plot to assassinate Alexander, but kept it secret. Hmm. Philotas and his father Parmenion were among the most respected of Alexander's commanders, and had played crucial roles in all his great victories. But when Philotas confessed, under torture, Alexander had him executed, then sent assassins back to Ecbatana, where Parmenion was governor, to kill him before he even heard of his son's death and had a chance to turn against Alexander. Wow! In 329, Alexander resumed his pursuit crazy, of Bessus. Wow. En route, he founded the city of Alexandria Arachosia, modern Kandahar in southern Afghanistan. Man, and all these cities now bear the same name still today, right? I know of Alexandria in Egypt. So that means they still have this Alexandra, Aria, Ariana, Alexandria, Aracosia. I mean, this is crazy, man. As he reached Kunduz, Bessus was betrayed by his own men and handed over in chains. Alexander sent him back to Persia for execution as a kingslayer. 
Alexander pushed on into modern Tajikistan, where the Sogdians rose up against him. Man, this guy was crazy. He had to fight off attacks by local tribes and take several towns by assault. On the banks of the Jaxartes River, he founded the city of Alexandria Escate, wow. meaning Alexandria the Furthest, so named because he had, at last, reached the limit of the Persian Empire. This frontier was frequently raided by nomads, known to the Greeks as Scythians. Alexander lured them into a decisive battle near the Chaxartes. The result was a crushing victory for the Macedonian king that put an end to the raids. But fighting against Bactrian and Sogdian tribes continued, frustrating Alexander and tying him down in a difficult guerrilla war. Man. By now, many of the Macedonian troops were unhappy with Alexander. Most had not seen their homes in years, but their king seemed bent on conquest without end. That's a, that's what was worse? Like, I would just continue conquering and continue, conquer, continue to conquer, continue to conquer. I mean, can't we rest? Seriously, even if I was a soldier there, I would be like, can't I rest? Can't I rest? I'm done. I'm absolutely done. Seriously. Maybe that would make me a traitor and make, get me executed. But, I mean, I get it. I mean, it's Alexander the Great and all that. But at some point, you have to just rest. You can't just keep fighting. He just can't keep fighting. Seriously, fighting is tough. He'd begun to adopt the rituals and dress of their defeated Persian enemy, customs they viewed as effeminate and decadent. Really? At Marakanda, modern Samarkand, after a furious drunken argument, Alexander killed Clytus the Black. Clytus had been one of Alexander's best generals, oh, this guy. and the man who'd saved his life at the Battle of the uh, Granicus. Fuck up, fuck up, Alexander fuck up. was full of remorse, but his growing arrogance was alienating more and more old comrades. When he tried to make his countrymen perform the traditional Persian ritual of proskinesis, prostrating themselves before the king, he crossed a line. To Greeks, this was blasphemy. Only a god was worthy of such respect, and Alexander was forced to back down. Power corrupts. Like they always say, power, power corrupts. I think at this point, he, he, he started feeling like he was a god. Seriously. I mean, conquering all these places like this and being part of the battle and not dying. At some point, you start thinking that you're a god. At some point, you start feeling like, I'm invincible. I'm a god. You know what I'm saying? So I, I really understand where he's coming from. I really understand why he felt he was a god at that point. In Bactria, another plot to assassinate Alexander was uncovered. This time, the ringleader was a royal page, one of the sons of Macedonian nobility who attended the king. Hermolaus had become murderously bitter towards Alexander over a perceived injustice. <laughs> he and his accomplices were tortured and then stoned to death. Callisthenes, Alexander's official historian, was also implicated in the conspiracy. He was thrown in prison, where he later died. That summer, in 327, According to legend, Alexander became captivated by the beauty of Roxana, daughter of a Bactrian lord. Their marriage was also a sound political move, helping to end local revolt against his rule, and allowing him to continue his advance into modern Pakistan 
and India. I mean, couldn't you just stop there? Alexander now prepared to subdue the Persian Empire's most eastern provinces, which had yet to recognize his kingship. To do so, he would first have to cross the Hindu Kush mountains and reach the Indus River Valley. Advancing in two columns, his army won a series of skirmishes against the Aspasi and Asakani as they fought their way into what's now the Swat Valley of northern Pakistan. After a fierce siege, Alexander took the Asakanian capital of Masaga. Man. According to legend, it was ruled by a beautiful queen, Cleophis, who bore Alexander a son and was allowed to keep her throne. The ruler of Taxila, near modern Islamabad, had formed an alliance. Poor Alexander his son. So Alexander does when they conquered the place, then slept with her. Really? I mean, some part of me feels like that was not sleeping with her. He, he kind of arrowed her or arrowed her. I mean, <laughs> the way this guy does, <laughs> the way he does narrated it in this video, like, oh, yeah, and he, she bought her a son. Really? We all know what happened. It's with Alexander. Together, they marched to face Porus, king of Poravas, at the Battle of the Hydaspes. It was Alexander's costliest battle, as Porus's war elephants inflicted terrible casualties amongst the Greeks. Damn. But despite Porus's fearless leadership, the battle ended in a decisive victory for Alexander, winning him control of the Punjab. Wow. Alexander wanted to push on into India to reach the Great River, which ancient Greek geographers said formed the edge of the world. But at the River Hyphasis, known today as the Bias, his army mutinied. I mean, his they were men tired. Had marched thousands of miles. I mean, seriously, no. Let's let's be re let's be real here, guys, guys, guys. If you are watching this, even if Alexander was so inspirational and you were, if you were fighting for him with the last of your blood and everything, like everything, you are so inspired and you want to die for him and all that shit. At some point, you have to rest. You have to rest at some point. You just can't keep fighting and fighting and fighting and fighting and fighting. It makes no sense. You have to rest at some point. So I, I understand. They have to meet in me. Fought countless battles and not seen their homes in eight years. They'd heard rumors of gigantic armies waiting for them in India. They refused to go any further. Alexander was furious, but had to turn the army around. He followed the rivers of the Punjab to the sea, a journey that took 10 months. On the way, he defeated the Malians, but while leading the assault on their capital, was wounded in the chest and nearly killed. On reaching the coast, part of the army under Nearchus boarded ships and returned to Persia by sea, sailing through the Straits of Hormuz and entering the Persian Gulf. It was one of the great ancient voyages of exploration, as these waters had been previously unknown to Greeks. Meanwhile, Alexander... The thing about it, I'm not sure humans knew, understood the whole voyage kind of thing, like they knew in the 17th or 18th century when the Europeans are moving. I'm not sure they knew it like that much. Like, so moving, using the sea, like this, must have been monumental. 
led the rest of the army back by land through the Gedrosian Desert, today in southern Pakistan. But extreme heat and shortages of food and water led to terrible suffering and many deaths among his army. Wow. On his return to Persia, Alexander executed several of his viceroys and governors, men accused of ruling unjustly and robbing temples and tombs during his long absence in the east. At Susa, he arranged a magnificent mass marriage of Macedonian officers to 80 Persian noblewomen to strengthen bonds between his two kingdoms. Alexander himself married two Persian princesses. He also paid all his soldiers' debts and ordered yeah. 30,000 youths from across the empire to be trained in the Macedonian art of war. But at Opis, his Macedonian troops mutinied. Okay, they Opus. I can remember Opus now. I made a video about it. I think that's the great, one of the greatest speeches in history. So I think that is where that speech happened, right? I think so. I think so. I, I hope I'm not wrong. I can remember it. I watched that thing. I watched it. Opus. Yeah, it has to be. We were offended by Alexander's apparent preference for Persian advisors and Persian ways. Alexander had the ringleaders executed and made a speech to the men reminding them of the glories they'd won together and leading eventually to an emotional reconciliation. Yeah, that is it. At Ekbatana, Alexander's closest and most trusted friend, Hephaestion, died of fever. Fever. Ah. The king was grief-stricken. Went days without I mean, eating. Imagine that fever, something that is so easy to cure these days. It's crazy. Modern medicine, modern technology has really, really made things to be normal. I mean, I have, in Africa, we have mosquitoes, we have malaria. So a lot of times we have fever. Yeah, just go and take some paracetamol. You are fine. I mean, that's all. That's all, that's, that's all you have to do. Crazy. And ordered a period of public mourning across the empire. Alexander waged a successful campaign against the mountain raiders of Kossia, who not even the Persian kings had been able to subdue. <laughs> Returning to Babylon, he was met by embassies from distant peoples, come to recognize his greatness. Ethiopians, Libyans, European Scythians, Lucanians, Etruscans, Gauls, and Iberians. Alexander's Bactrian wife, Roxana, was now pregnant. But as he planned his next campaign to Arabia and beyond, he developed a sudden fever and died days well, let later. Me, let me get something. If he didn't develop this sudden fever, and died. Was he planning to keep conquering for the rest of his life? I get it. At some point, you just feel like you can keep conquering, can keep conquering, can keep conquering. But that seems like a very stressful life. Maybe he enjoyed it. Maybe. Yeah. Age just 32. That is crazy, man. The cause of Alexander's death has never been established. It may have been malaria, cholera, or Typhus or poison. Yeah, I, mean, I think it's poison. I think it's poison. Alexander died undefeated in battle. His reputation as a brilliant, fearless, and daring military commander remains undimmed. His decade long campaign created one of the largest empires ever known stretching from Greece to Pakistan. But it was vast and unstable, held together only by his own brilliance and name. Alexander left no plans for his succession, and his generals soon began fighting among themselves wow. to carve out their own empires. Understandable. 
In the wars of the successors, Alexander's widow Roxana and his young son were murdered. His own gold sarcophagus, en route to Macedonia for burial, was hijacked and ended up in Alexandria in Egypt. Hmm. Today, its location remains one of the world's great unsolved mysteries. Really? Nobody knows his, his grave? Wow, since that time? That is crazy. Damn. Few men have ever had such an impact on the course of history as Alexander the Great. The breathtaking achievements of his short life ushered in the Hellenistic Age, as Greek ideas spread across the territory of his former empire, fusing with local so traditions peace. to trigger new developments in art, science, government and language. Some of the successor kingdoms to his great empire were short-lived, others endured for centuries. But all, in turn, would fall to new forces. And in the West, to the rising power the Romans. of Rome. Man, I'm going crazy. I'm going crazy right now. Seriously. This is absolutely unbelievable. Unbelievable, guys. Oh, damn. So, if you think about all this now, Okay, let's look at the the timeline. The Greeks, <clears throat> ancient Greece, the ancient Greeks were having issues with the whole Sparta and all that stuff and all that stuff that was going on. They now had Alexander who came down from Macedonia, took over, and Greece was amalgamated down to you know the same empire with the Macedonia and the Greece. Then, obviously, from what we have just seen here, it was never satisfied by sitting down one place. He just didn't want to sit down one place. He wanted to be out, 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 out here trying to invade and take over and conquer and do all these things. So obviously, they started going east. Going east. And his plan was to go to the end and the edge of the known world at that point in time. Which didn't work, obviously, because his soldiers were like, dude, dude, we are tired. We are fucking tired. We can't do this shit anymore. We can't. So they had to now start going back, and that was the end of it in terms of the conquest. But it was it was now showed that he was still trying, planning to conquer the Arabians. I mean, oh, I feel the guy at that point was feeling like a god. He was still in his late twenties, early thirties. I mean, can you imagine? Can you imagine? This guy died. Okay, how old am I now? I'm thirty-two. That means this guy died at my age. He died at my age. And he, had, he achieved all these things. Meanwhile, I'm sitting down here, a failure in life compared to him. Actually, not even compared to him. Compared to a lot of people. <sighs> Man, this is sad. This is sad. But great for him. Great for Alexander. This was a very, very incredible video. And I do know that <laughs> the, the, the petrol or gasoline that I have used for this video probably would will drain me but i had to do this because i've been told to check out this video for a very long time and i do hope that you guys help me out and hit the like button that's all i need from you i'm not asking you guys for money just hit the like button you lose nothing you lose absolutely nothing hit the like button for me to get this video out to more people and if you are new subscribe to the channel i really appreciate it see you on the next one peace